Hello and welcome to Chimera, Britain's only book festival celebrating science fiction, fantasy and horror writing. My name is Anne Landman and I'm the festival's founder and artistic director. Right about now I hope to be welcoming you to beautiful Edinburgh, to our venue The Pleasance, for a weekend packed with events. Writing workshop panels, readings, open mics, a quiz, a Kaylee, two plays, we had so much in store for you. Thank you for joining us online instead to be part of our programme from the safety of your homes. We're very excited to still bring you a fantastic lineup of speakers. We'd ask you that you support our speakers, and there's many ways you can do that. You can buy their books or borrow them from the library. You can donate to them directly via their Patreon or Coffee. You will find the links for that below in the description. We encourage you to buy a ticket for our events, even the pre-recorded ones. All ticket money will go directly to our speakers. You can also donate to the festival and all donations via the donation page will be split between our speakers once we've covered our costs like the Zoom account. Thank you again for joining us in this brave new world of digital events. We hope you have a chance to check out all 33 of ours over the weekend. Please let us know what you think of them. Do get in touch via social media the chat function in Zoom, or drop us an email on info at chimerafestival.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year for Chimera 2021. Right, welcome to Chimera 2020, Scotland's Festival of Science Fiction, Fantasy and Horror Writing. Uh, my name is Anne Landman, I'm the festival director and I am here to say hello, but I also have the incredible pleasure to be introducing our Brave New Words slot. Brave New Words is an emerging writer based in Scotland who are just starting on their journey and we are here to support them with this. So we invite people to write, to read five, up to five minutes of a new piece of writing that they want to introduce to an audience and I'm very excited that to be here with Catalina Watt, who is a Philippinic British author, published in Haunted Voices, Ceremony, and Speakable Malefaction magazine, Fan Vital, which is new and amazing. We'll check it out. An Extra Tea, issue two, forthcoming, which is also amazing. She's currently working on her debut short story collection based on the folklore of the Philippines, exploring colonialism, femininity, and queerness. Catalina is reading an extract from Lure which is a short story in the forthcoming before mentioned Extra Tea issue two. So please, wherever you are, put your hands together for Catalina. Okay, yeah, so um, this is an extract from Lua. <laughs> they had both been born in the yawning blackness of the city. She was always singled out by the circumstances of her birth a glut of mindless indulgences, where everything was as simple as holding out a glass and having it filled. He, on the other hand, had slid out into this world, scrappy, restless, and perpetually hungry. Her days were always bookended with rich meals. His were filled with staving off his most basic desires. She glided along through her life swallowing men whole and absorbing whatever she wanted. He was frantically searching for his purpose, for that someone who could fill the void. They finally met on a beautiful autumn evening when he clapped eyes on her like a light in the distance, her every breath pulsing through her as though she were bioluminescent. The music was distant to him, a creature's moaning reverberating through the ocean. He couldn't resist the trail she had left him, and he moved towards her silently, trying to sense if she had noticed him. She was close now, and she wasn't moving away. She glittered in her evening gown, the tendrils of her headdress floating and reaching towards him. Her eyes were dark and bulbous and unseeing, but a sparkling lure drew him closer. Her mouth was a large and cavernous beauty, full of serrated blades, and she could swallow him without even knowing she had done it. She was eating caviar 
and he watched in fascination as she popped each morsel into her mouth with a delighted smile. She curved her spine slowly and a glint emanated from her ring as it caught the light. They swam around each other in conversation all night and he admired the coils of her arms and the glow on her as she rippled and danced. The smell of her as she moved was wild, the hunger inside him unbearable. He had only known craving, but now he had finally found her. He was surprised when she asked him to come home with her, but relieved that she wouldn't have to see his shabby apartment. He felt nervous on the drive home and couldn't punctuate the silence. She rested her hand on his thigh and he thought he might die before they got there. When they arrived, she asked if he was hungry and said that somebody would fix him a snack, but he wanted to get upstairs as quickly as possible. Only she could break this gnawing inside him. She led him into the bedroom and sat down on the bed, patting it gently to indicate that he should join her. He perched there and focused on the side of her face as they drew closer, they were practically touching. She leant forward and kissed him and pushed him back on the bed. They quickly slipped into their skin and he explored every part of her, from the translucent webbing of her fingers to the gills that blew hot air onto his face. She told him that she was ready and he lunged forward and opened his mouth, biting down hard on her side. His jaw was working hard to keep them together. She wasn't struggling, but she was becoming swollen and vast and he couldn't keep purchase on her. He felt the enzymes flowing rapidly from his body into hers and soon his skin was disintegrating. Soon there was a smooth passage between them. His bones melted inside his skin, his internal organs dissolved. He was fused with her. Thank you. Thank you for that, Katharina. Uh, <laughs> fantastic reading. Right. Hello everyone and welcome to The Enduring Dread, a live panel interview for Chimera Festival, Scotland's leading festival dedicated to science fiction, fantasy and horror. And I'm proud to bring you this panel with two of the most influential horror writers to have ever graced the genre. Please give a warm welcome to Ramsey Canzel, uh, I'm sorry, Ramsey Campbell and Lisa Tuttle. <laughs> and if you would like to submit any questions to our guests, please do so via the comment sections below. Uh, before we dive in, please let me if you can actually introduce two guests such as Ramsey and Lisa, but I'll give it a go here. Described as Britain's most respected living horror writer by the Oxford Companion to English Literature, Ramsey Campbell has won multiple British Fantasy and World Fantasy Awards, several Bram Stokers and International Horror Guild Awards. He is the author of such classic works of horror and dark fantasy such as Obsession, The Face Must Die, The Nameless, Incarnate and The Influence, and more recently, just published by Flame Tree Press, the very excellent The Wise Friend. In 1976, saw the publication of Campbell's first novel, The Doll Who Ate His Mother, which immediately drew acclaim from such figures such as Fritz Lieber and T.E.D. Klein. And now 44 years later, <clears throat> we see the publication of The Wise Friend, which is among the quietest of Ramsey's works. This novel draws on folk horror as a father seeks to protect his son, who has become involved with the legacy with occult overtones. Um, he also has a new novella, The Enigma of the Flat Policeman, part of Borderlands Press Little Book series, which was released in March of this year, uh, which consists of a concise detective novel the author wrote aged 14 in imitation of John Dixon Carr, with annotations exploring the adult author's perceptions of his younger self mental state at the time of composition. Our second guest is the fabulous Lisa Tuttle, an award-winning author of science fiction, fantasy and horror. Lisa made her first short story sale while a student at Syracuse University in New York and won the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 1974. Her first novel, written in collaboration with George R. R. Martin Windhaven, uh, has been in print since 1981 and was adapted <coughs> by her into a graphic novel. Her most recent novels are part of a detective series with supernatural elements set in the 1890s England, such as The Curious Affair of the Somnambulist and Psychic Thief, and The Curious Affair of the Witch at Wayside Cross, which Lisa is now just showing us. In addition to fiction, Lisa has written non-fiction, well, obviously, <laughs> including the Encyclopedia of Feminism and writing fantasy and science fiction. 
And as an editor, she has compiled several anthologies, including Skin of the Soul, and, and new, new Horror Stories by Women and Crossing the Border, Tales of Erotic Ambiguity. Lisa's fiction often focuses on gender issues and includes strong-willed women who question their identities. British author David W. Barrett wrote that our stories are emotionally uncomfortable and they not only make you think, they make you feel. Valancourt Books have just released their classic collection, A Nest of Nightmares, as part of their Paperbacks from Hell series created by Grady Hendrix, which is tasked with bringing out-of-print classic horror novels and collections back into the forefront of the genre. Right, so the theme of today's panel is the Enduring Dread, where we hope to explore not so much the history of the horror genre, but how the genre in terms of both reading, writing and public perception has changed over the years, and how writers such as Ramsey and Lisa have managed to ride these changes and remain relevant and influential voices within the genre. But before we continue, I would invite Ramsey and Lisa to say a few words about their latest publications, if they would like to. Oh, shall I go first? Okay, all right, here we go. Um, let me, I shall display this here, which is The Wise Friend, which Jim's already referred to, um, which is, uh, it's, it, it, it's, I suppose, my attempt to do the kind of supernatural fiction that I most love, which is to say, you know, the kind that Alvin Blackwood and Arthur Macken uh, were, were masters of. Um, and I suppose there's a hint of M.R. Jones in there as well, in terms of you know, the, the, the thing you don't quite know whether you're seeing out of the corner of your eye, the, 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 the shadow that moves and it should not, that, that kind of a thing. Um, in addition, I kind of like the, the, the whole central idea, which is, if you like, my, my kind of riff on the case of Charles Dexter Ward, the, the, the great Lovecraft novel. It just occurred to me the notion that, um, you know, a, a place where an occultist is buried might then be imbued with their essence. And so, you know, if you, if you take away a, a sample of that earth, you may have a little bit of them to, to communicate with. And I think that, that was probably the germ of the novel, though by the time I've finished writing a novel, I'm never very sure where it came from in general terms. But, um, well, I had fun with it, and other folks seem to have too. Cool. Right. Um, as for me, well, my most recent is, of course, a reprint of my very first short story collection, Horror Stories. Um, but, and I can also give you uh, a little, um, I don't know, breaking news uh, and announce that my first, my debut horror novel, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Familiar Spirit is going to come out also from Valancourt, uh, also in their Paperbacks from Hell uh, series. That'll be out in uh, September. So I just heard that, uh, just, I mean, that's just been this past week. Um, my other most recent novel, well, my most recent novel is, as I said before, or as Jim said, uh, in a, a detective uh, series that has elements of the fantastic mingled with kind of, you know, regular kind of mystery. Um, I'm writing, it's, it's only very marginally connected to horror, I would say, but the one I'm writing now, I'm writing a third uh, Jesperson and Lane adventure, and this is probably the closest to a horror novel um, in that in that series. I think the first one was a sort of fantastic adventure. Uh, the second one is more of a classic detective story, you know, a whodunit with a few little odd supernatural occult things going on in the background. And this third one is about well, it's got Egyptian mummies in it, so I think it's <laughs> it's fairly. Uh, got a good trope, a good horror trope. Just before I actually ask the first question I'd like, with the mention of the mummies there, they're probably the least used horror monster in fiction and, and, and in films. Do you think there's a reason for that? Well, yes. <laughs> I think, <laughs> actually, I mean, how scary are they? You know, they're, they're, already, they're dead bodies. I mean, in a way, they, they could be a bit like zombies if, you know, if they kind of come to life, they're usually more connected with ancient curses. And I think it was a kind of, I think it's very much of the kind of period between about the 18, maybe the 1880s or even earlier, the 1860s, right up until Lord Carnarvon and the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb and all the talk about curses. And although I know there have been more recent mummy films, they're kind of, 
I don't know, postmodern in a way, kind of being very knowing. Mm. Uh, so I think that's why I don't think people are, are that. They might be attracted to the idea and the kind of imagery in the ancient Egyptian, all that stuff about the afterlife, the book of the dead, weird spells, the whole idea that, that all magic originated in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating stuff, but in terms of, I don't know, guess real threat or horror level, I think the mummy is, uh, is, is, is not at the top of the list. Yeah, when I think about it, I think the two the two most frightening images of that are, are one, the resurrection of Karloff in the original film, which is genuinely frightening, I think, much more so than anything in the Hammer film, although that has its own merits. And the other thing, of course, is Conan Doyle's fast-moving mummy in lot 249, which is, is genuinely frightening. And, you know, Conan Doyle underrated as a writer of supernatural horror fiction. He, he brings it off very well there. Hmm. Oh, anything can be terrifying if it's oh, done yeah. in the right way. I think. Yeah, but I'm thinking, you know, that it was all at the start of the genre, as you say. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Right, so when you both first started writing, what was your relationship to the label of horror? You know, did you, did you think of horror as a label? And did you have a sort of clear sense of what horror was to the, sort of the general public? Not in terms of the general public necessarily, but certainly for myself. I mean, and I mean, my focus was Lovecraft, of course, when I was in my mid-teens. My first book was Imitation Lovecraft and was published by Arkham House, August Durless. Um Now, I think immediately after that, I, I kind of went off on my, what I wanted to think of as my own direction. But I think the point was that I, I already had a, a much wider notion of what horror fiction was. Um, on the one hand, I mean, and I was deriving it from from films like Last Year in Marion, which I found deeply disturbing, the Bunuel film, Los Olvidados, which is actually a realist film set in Mexico City about street gangs, but kind of pushes over into surrealism. These are two films I saw when I was 15, 16, I think. Um, and on the other, something that shaped my attitude to the field very profoundly, and it's never gone away, um, was a book called Best Horror Stories, edited by John Keir Cross, The Fader. Uh, and in the midst of all the, you know, the expected names like M.R. James and Poe and so forth, there were, the, there were less expected ones like Graham Greene. But the, the real standout for me, and I first read it when I was 11 years old in this book, was Herman Melville's Bartleby, which the, the editor said, the, the anthologist said, you know, many people would not think of this as horror at all. But for me, it fitted. You know, it, I didn't feel cheated having spent my pocket money on a hardcover book at you know, 11 years old. I felt in some way that sort of psychological intensity, but equally great subtlety, was part of horror. And so, you know, in a way, my, my, my definition of horror was very capacious by the time I reached my, well, certainly, you know, mid to late teens. Um, and I was trying to bring more of that into the field, if you like, what, once I started off as myself rather than, you know, poor man's Lovecraft. Uh, well, my, Sorry. <clears throat> my down to love, <laughs> what? Um, for me, it, it was quite different, really, in that I didn't think of it as horror. It was scary stories, spooky stories, ghost stories. My father had several kind of classic collections. I mean, there was what the great ghost stories of the world, great tales of uh, the supernatural, or suspense in the supernatural, or there was one something about psychic, I can't remember what it was called, ghost and psychic tales, I think. Anyway, there were a lot of kind of books that came out in the 30s and 40s. And so I read those because they were, and I, I mean, it was much easier as a child, I think, to get started on short stories rather than kind of tackle a big fat adult novel. So, and, and I always, like a lot of kids, I loved ghost stories, scary stories. So, by the time, and I don't know, I mean, I kind of think in a way, uh, science fiction was the dominating genre back in the 60s. Um, and so what I like to read, everything was in that kind of fantastic genre. Some of it was what we would call horror now, but I, I don't think horror didn't seem to emerge as such an obvious genre in my perception anyway, until well, maybe the late 70s and early 80s. And of course, the big boom time was the 80s. 
And even then though, in the eighties, I felt a bit reluctant, I think, to embrace the term of horror because so much of what I was interested in and wanted to write was, was fairly, well, it was either psychological horror. It wasn't, you know, as Stephen King, where he kind of says in the end, you know, well, if nothing else works, you go for the gross out. Well, I have occasionally gone for the gross out. I will admit that. But it was not my first uh, love, either as a reader or as a writer. I like sort of more subtle things. So strange stories that Robert Aikman wrote, or um, I don't know. And, and I wasn't a big Lovecraft fan. I mean, I did, I remember things like The Rats in the Walls, which totally freaked me out when I was about 11 or 12. But I didn't, even though my boyfriend in high school was collecting Arkham House books, and he kind of said, what? You haven't read all of Lovecraft? You have to read all of Lovecraft. So I read a lot of Lovecraft, and we'll talk more about him later, I'm sure, but it was, he wasn't such a huge influence on me. Um, what does horror and other speculative genres offer writers such as yourself, you know, to explore themes that, that non-genre fiction doesn't really allow for? You know, do you think there's, it allows you to explore more fully and, and, and more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sympathetically, certain issues that you, that you like to write about? Well, on the whole, I'd say probably not. I don't, I don't really hive it off from the mainstream in that way. I suppose the, the one thing I would say is the uncanny, you know, that there is more of a predilection for that in our field uh, than elsewhere. But, even, you know, you can certainly find it elsewhere. I mean, it certainly is in the mainstream. But actually part of my argument has always been that horror was originally part of the mainstream anyway. I mean, you, you actually look back in, not merely in terms of people like um, Poe, you know, who, who, who in a sense are just coming out of the Gothic, or re refining the Gothic novel, if you like, but perhaps more to the point, um, you know, in last century, certainly in the early decades of the last century, horror wasn't really kind of treated as that separate. You know, people like Elizabeth Bowen, L.P. Hartley, a e. Coppard, you know, there are many others, just a few. Um, they would write horror fiction that would be included in collections of short stories of theirs, or indeed anthologized in short story collections. But, you know, they, they were not treated as being particularly separate. Some of the stories were horror, many were not. Even actually, Nigel Neal, famous for the Quatermass stories, you know, his first book, Tomato Cane, has some horror stories that are very powerful they are too, but a lot of them are, are mainstream. And indeed, you think of some, I mean, a great story like, you know, The Monkey's Paw, um, that most of W.W. Uh, of, of w. W. Jacobs is, is not horror fiction. But I think it was Robert Aikman who made this point to me once, or if not, I'll make it anyway, that, that a lot of writers, a lot of short story writers particularly, are now remembered mainly for their horror fiction, which presumably must tell us something. Okay. Why, why do you think then that that shift in perception of it being part of the mainstream to being becoming a genre, what, what do you think caused that to happen? Well, I think it was when, when, the, when, the, when the term was used as, as, as a marketing device, I suppose. And, and that, you know, really starts, as far as I can see, back in the 1920s. Oddly enough, not so much with the Christine Campbell Thompson Not at Night series, which drew extensively on, uh, from uh, the, the original issues of Weird Tales magazine. Um, but actually somebody like, say, Dorothy L. Sayers, who, who was actually the first to use horror in an anthology title, Great, Great Job Stories of Detection, Mystery and Horror. And it, again, it seems to me that what she was trying to do, as Keir Cross was doing that, later on in that book that I mentioned, was, was to try and um, reclaim horror fiction as a branch of literature to demonstrate that that is what it was. Um, so I think that, it, that then, of course, becomes the conflict or starts the conflict between, you know, the mainstream and horror fiction, uh, although they're not necessarily separate at all. Yeah, I think there's something to do with uh, marketing <clears throat> that does this. I don't <clears throat> why it happened. I have no idea. But Michael Chabon wrote something about this some years ago about, he wrote an essay about all these, um, all these great writers who wrote all across genres. I mean, he said there, it used to just be fiction, basically, that people wrote. And then you, you got put into smaller and smaller boxes. And of course, as the 
um, market for short fiction has changed. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know why particular magazines would come out where they were only going to be science fiction. They were only going to be mystery. They were only going to be adventure. They were only going to be manly adventure. They were only going to be, you know, hospital romances. It, it's a, it's a kind of a strange thing. And I, I still don't really understand it, but there, I do know because I've worked in a library that there are people, a number of people who really only want to read one type of thing and whether they're horror fans or whether they want gentle romances, they, I mean, some of them are very specific, you know, they only want Scottish set romances or they, you know, only want mysteries or they only want Westerns, but that's, that's never been, I mean, I've always liked to read very widely and I think, the, the problem, or, I mean, it's been both a positive and a negative with horror being seen as a genre. Yes, it got a lot more attention. It got more, more books were being published that were specifically horror that weren't maybe being sent to an editor who would go, mm, this isn't quite literary enough. I, and it's not science fiction and it's not crime. I don't know how to publish it, send it back. But at the same time, it also then made, it was, oh, it's only a horror novel. So, you know. Mm. Um, the, the horror genre itself has seen massive periods where it's been you know, highly popular and, and then just crashing into nowhere. I imagine probably the late 80s, early 90s saw the biggest bust period for us. What do you think caused this bust and, bust and how did the pair of you um, ride out to this to actually keep your writing career growing during this period where nobody was really reading horror anymore? It's crap, basically. I think. <laughs> they published too oh, much garbage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, go on, go on. You, you, you answer first for change, Lisa. I've got my answer too, but you go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, I think it's the same thing. Yes, if you publish too many things, it just kind of overwhelms. Like, you can't sell as many copies. I mean, it, it's as if, I mean, and the same thing happens sometimes to individual authors. <clears throat> if you bring out uh, three books by the author, right at the same time, a lot of people just say, well, I'll just buy one. And then maybe by the time they go back to get the other one, well, it's already off the shelf. Books don't have a very long shelf life now. And I don't think people stopped reading horror, but they didn't maybe buy it in sufficient numbers. And what was happening was what always seems to happen in publishing, which is people start looking at the bottom line. You know, we're not selling enough of this. And it's this type of thing that we're not selling. So line, entire lines that had been set up, imprints, you know, to publish only horror were seen as, well, they're no longer paying their way. So they didn't stop publishing every single author, but they would say, well, fine, we'll just publish Clive Barker and Stephen King and, you know, as just as in our main lists, and we're not going to have this little, you know, offshoot here anymore. Um, what was it? Oh, yes. The other question <laughs> about how did we survive? Well, yeah, I'll say. Uh, how did you sort of read this out? To survive the, the 90s. Well, I had a baby at the beginning of the 90s. So <laughs> it, my life was going to be changed dramatically anyway. And I did write other things, which I always have done. I was writing. Um, I wrote some children's books. Uh, I'd already started writing more nonfiction. You know, so. Ramsey, over to you. Yeah, well, uh, the funny thing is I, I'd already been there once in a sense because, you know, I actually went full time as a writer back in 73 and horror really wasn't doing anything much at all then either. Although, you know, Kirby McCauley, my agent, did his best to persuade me to, to write a novel which would which, you know, which would be more marketable, which I ultimately did. But, I, you know, first of all, in the mid 70s, I was actually writing very bad science fiction, almost none of which sold, uh, and I collected it all in a book called Inconsequential Tales, which uh, pretty well gives you, gives you the quality of the stories. Um, <laughs> came the 90s, though, I still do remember the, the, the you know, the, 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 well, more the disconcerting, the dismaying moment when I heard from my agent that, you know, well, you, you can't write your kind of thing anymore, you've got to write something else, was basically <laughs> the message I got. And you need to write something like Thomas Harris. Well, you know, no, I write like Ramsey Campbell, actually. <laughs> and I can't stop. I, that, that's all I can do. You know, I, I think that's just my problem, I'm afraid. So I, I but, but the thing was that I did try writing non-supernatural horror, which was much closer to crime fiction. 
uh, even though it's preoccupations of the same. And actually, once I kind of engaged with it in ways that still spoke to me, I was able to write. And so I wrote three um, crime novels in succession, in fact, in the, the, the mid to late 90s. Um, and then, oh, I still remember this, actually. I remember, I forget which World Fantasy Convention it was, but uh, my editor, Melissa Singer, uh, from Tor, was in the audience. And I said, look, you know, I've written these three crime novels. I was on a panel. Oh, actually, no, I'll tell you what. I think it was, um, I think it was Niagara, actually. I was being interviewed on, yes, being interviewed on stage by uh, Caitlin Kiernan. And um, so just talking about what, what am I going to do next? I said, look, I've got this idea for a supernatural horror novel. L uh, Melissa, you know, can I write it? She said, go, go on, do it. And so that became the darkest part of the woods. And that was the, the turning point back into supernatural horror for me. And I've never gone away again, except when, the, uh, when ideas suggest themselves to me. You know, sometimes I still will, in fact, write a, a non-supernatural novel that's closer to crime, actually. There's probably half a dozen books of mine. If you if I'd written nothing else but them, I'd probably be seen as a crime writer. Mm. And then, but but you know what I still call them horror, and I'm proud to say that's what I write. <laughs> well, I have to say too that I didn't wasn't writing steadily uh, horror novels, and indeed I had one novel was turned down again and again because, well, it's not horror, but it's not really anything else. You know, and so again, you get that dreadful thing was where a publisher says, I don't know how to publish this. Mm -hmm. And that's so depressing when that yeah. happens. Well, you know, I was afraid this was going to happen with my latest novel, but no, my, my good friends at Flame Tree Press will get onto them later. But they, they, they said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll buy it. And they just did. So there you go. Okay. This question is primarily aimed at you, Lisa. Um, Doing a lot of research and looking at previous interviews that, that you've both done, there always seems to be a question to you, Lisa, where they're amazed that you're a female horror writer. Now, you would you, you think that by now we, we've, got, <laughs> we've got past this, that, that women actually do, and a lot of women do, write fantastic horror. But why do you think we still get caught up on this, that, that, that you as a female writer are unique when you're clearly not unique in that terms? I, I don't know. It's, um, in fact, it reminds me of when I would be interviewed when I was a lot younger, and they would always say things like, Lisa Tuttle is very innocent looking, or they would say, oh, you look too sweet to write those nasty stories. And I would sometimes think, I wonder, do they ever say, do they say that to Ramsey Campbell? <laughs> they don't say I'm sweet, no, no. <laughs> but there is, it is a odd I don't know. I really don't know what it is. And the whole question about women in horror, which, in fact, when you uh, when you you sent a little list of some of the possible questions, and one was about the whole issue of, uh, you know, women getting fed up with being saying, oh, whatever you do, don't put me on uh, a women in horror panel, you know, when you go to a to a convention. Um, but I suddenly thought, yes, I just had been answering questions about being about a woman writing horror. And I was trying to remember who it was because my memory is not so good now. And then I remembered it was my uh, Italian translator because I've got a short story collection coming out later this year in Italy. And she had asked about that. And so when I began to answer it, I realized I was talking about my early experiences as a science fiction writer, a woman science fiction writer, where that was always the first question. And yet when I began writing and getting published, there were, it was a time when women science fiction writers were very much seen as the kind of leading voices in the field. There was Ursula Le Guin, Joanna Russ, Kate Wilhelm, uh, and then younger ones, Vonda McIntyre, and all sorts of, I mean, it was just, it wasn't surprising. In fact, I can remember once where there was someone wrote an article about all the, all the best new writers in science fiction are women except for James Tiptree Jr. And of course, James Tiptree Jr. was a pseudonym for a woman writer. So, and then it seems like, well, yeah, all right. It, it, maybe it happens in all genres. I mean, I don't think it's ever happened in, I don't know, maybe if it was hard boiled crime, women might be looked at like, oh, why are you writing, you know, oh, how can a woman write tough crime? But since women 
were big crime writers back in the golden age of you know mystery fiction that wasn't uh, sort of an issue but maybe it was you know i wasn't around in the 20s and 30s so maybe they were getting the same question um i don't know it's just one of those things and you get very often i remember having arguments with uh, both charles platt and greg benford about whether i mean well charles platt because he'd done a lot of interviews and he said, oh, I just spoke to the writers that I really admire. And well, surprise, surprise, they weren't a lot of women. In fact, I think he only spoke to one woman writer. But when I sort of brought this up with him saying, well, it's all very well going around and interviewing the writers you want to talk to. But when you put them together as a book, shouldn't there be a few of the big women writers? Well, he did confess that some of them wouldn't talk to him, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But he also tried to argue that most women were actually fantasy writers, not science fiction writers. And I had the same argument with Greg Benford a few years later, where he, he just made some flat statement about, oh, all, this, all these fantasy writers getting published. It's because there's women, women editors now are the ones with all the power. And they really just like fantasy. They don't like sci real science fiction. <laughs> just, well, I guess, I guess there will always be some I was going to say people, and I go, well, there will always be some men who will come up with an excuse for why <laughs> women get published and they don't. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Is that enough? Probably. <laughs> I agree with all of that. Yeah. 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 Right, we've met Lovecraft's been mentioned a few times, so it would be um, remiss of me not to, to mention him. <laughs> Out of all the, the writers who've gone before us, Lovecraft's legacy is the one that still hangs there right in front of us. Why do you think he's the only, probably the only writer whose mythos and whose, the worlds that he created are still such a huge influence on t today's writers, you know, over a hundred years probably since, since, you know, his first publication? Well, I miss, miss, I'm inclined to say the mythos is probably too much of an influence these days. I mean, there's <laughs> too much of it. it you know, it sprawls in every possible direction. I think yeah, also, I, I have to say, I think one of the reasons of, for his huge popularity, not by any means the only one, but the whole business of you know, the role-playing games and the like. Um, there, are, there are many, many people now who, you know, you, who would, could tell you a little bit about Lovecraft without ever having read a, a line of his prose, you know, or they've seen the films, of which there are, there are many equally, or, or they own a plush Cthulhu, or however you want to pronounce it, you know, they, or they gave, him to, you know, you know, gave that to their baby to play with, God help them. Um, <laughs> now, you know, to my mind, Lovecraft's merits are, are, are uh, certainly I mean, the mythos is important, and I try to add my own little you know, little bits to it back, back way back when. Um, but to, to my mind, what, what's really crucial is, and, and it's odd because he's so often seen as, as a bad stylist. I, I think at his best, he's a remarkably fine stylist, not least in terms of modulation of prose. I mean, the notion that, you know, he overused adjectives and the like. When you actually examine most of his best stories, it's very, very carefully built up. You eventually do get these explosions of adjectives in some of the stories, but by heavens, that's not how the entire story is told. Nothing like, you know, it's a very gradual escalation, an accumulation of, of detail. And also, I think that also goes to the, the sense of structure, which in his best work, again, is, 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 is exemplary. Um, I think we also have to address the fact that, you know, Lovecraft had, had certain failings, to put it mildly, uh, in terms of his attitudes, particularly politically. But I do think at the moment he's being excessively perceived in terms of his faults, um, not by everyone by any means, but, you know, I think a bit like Wagner at, at one time. I think ultimately, you know, the balance will be re-established and what I see is, you know, considerable merits will also be perceived. Yeah, I think, um, in fact, the answer to your question, Jim, I was thinking was the very fact that you said mythos. Mm. How many other horror writers have a mythos? I mean, some have particular, um, I don't know, ambiance or uh, obsessions that they return to again and again, like most writers. But it's hit, Lovecraft fits into that same kind of world as, a, as the, the world building fantasy writers. And, and I think, as, as Ramsey said, other people pick it up, they play with it, they're drawn to it. 
And the other thing I think that is very, um, I don't know, uh, attractive and different um, uh, about Lovecraft from other writers is the kind of cosmic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Because most horror, horror writing seems to be as more, uh, well, either it's psychological, which I do like, or it's much more um, particular. You know, it's uh, about some particular type of monster or it's just, a, or torture or whatever. But with Lovecraft, you've got those kind of cosmic beings, the whole idea of this, the great old ones and this kind of mystery that just kind of hangs over everything. And it, it's very, there's something extremely attractive about that and, and frightening. You know, it's, it's quite uh, terrifying. And the other thing about his, his prose style, I admit I've sometimes fallen into that kind of casual thing of, oh, he wasn't a very good writer. Except one of the things that struck me is often what I'm thinking of is a parody of Lovecraft. He was very easy to parody. I mean, he is very easy to parody. But the reason for that, I think, is the people that are easiest to parody actually really have something. It's yeah. just, it's recognizable. And so the satirist can pick it up and write a story, which when I remember reading, I think a friend of mine probably wrote it. It was probably in a fanzine in my teens, which is, it ends with, and the last thing he saw as the horror, or the last thing I saw as the horror descended upon me was the horror descending upon me. I can, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have to admit that I do take the Lovecraft thing maybe a little bit too far. My, my daughter is called Ella. And I think almost from the day that she was born, she's been sort of nicknamed Cuthella. And <laughs> even got a t-shirt made up for her with, with, you know, I'm Cuthella, all your gods are dead written all over it. Um, but yeah, it's, you can't help yourself when, when you get so invested in a, in a writer and their works. Um, horror loves its tropes. It, it, it loves its period of, this is, a, you know, the zombie period, the vampire period, but neither of you have actually sort of ever ridden the giant waves of this. Is, is there a reason for that? Well, I, mean, you know, I did write a vampire novel not very long ago, uh, although it doesn't, doesn't necessarily own up to being one immediately. But uh, uh -huh. yeah. And in fact, it's, it's odd because in a way, you know, I, 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 say, I used to say for, 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 for decades, I would never write a vampire novel, not because I don't think other people have written very good ones. On the contrary, it's that I felt I didn't have anything to add, you know, and therefore there was no point in my just you know, contriving something for the sake of doing so. And then this idea came to me, oh, on, on, a, on a road trip in, uh, in, in Zakynthos in Greece, actually, which is why the, the novel is set on a Greek island. And I thought, you know, maybe there is something to be done with the vampire that hasn't quite yet been done. And here's the thing. Um, in fact, in a way, we're going back to Lovecraft again, because, you know, Lovecraft didn't, didn't deal with the, the conventional monsters either. He felt they were played out even back then. And so when, when, when we actually come to my, to my monstrous vampire at the end of this particular novel, I actually had that in mind from Lovecraft, and I suppose in a way, the shunned house, uh, where you, you have this, this monstrous vampiric entity beneath a house, uh, which is only very partially revealed. Um, the, at the back of my mind was, was something like that, to make, you know, to reclaim uh, the monstrousness of the vampire if I possibly could, and that, in a sort of a way, made that book worth writing. Lisa? Oh, gosh. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I can't even explain what, I mean, it's the, that whole thing of getting an idea or getting uh, uh, something that won't go away. Mm -hmm. And I don't start, I mean, I don't start working. I mean, I'm not even very good if I get invited to write for say a vampire anthology. It's like, well, I probably won't be able to come up with it. it even that, which it seems like a large enough uh, brief is too specific. So what might happen is um, three years later, <laughs> I might get an idea. And if so, I will then write it. But as far as, you know, I mean, I remember years ago, I knew quite a number of people. There was, it was right when the kind of, horror like the crabs and uh you know the the lobsters and the 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 squid or whatever were, were becoming you know and i had friends who were writing them and selling them and it was kind of like oh lisa you can do it too and i was thinking well 
why can't I? You know, it's just not possible somehow. I don't know. My imagination doesn't uh, seem to work that way. I think it's true. I think the simple thing is, if, you, if it doesn't engage our imagination, we can't write it. I think that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. So no pandemic novel coming from either of you. Well, you know, I, I was going, I was saying that to myself for quite a while. Um, but the idea I've got for not the novel I'm now writing, but next the one next on might well have that as a background. Uh, I didn't set out to do it, but you know, the more I think about how I'm going to deal with this particular idea, which you'll forgive me not specifying, uh, the more that the the pandemic would seem like you know a, a significant background and, and maybe we do have to acknowledge it in some way in our fiction and maybe once you know i've done that once i don't have to do it again well i had a an idea for a short story oh when was it it was last spring i think and i was and i made notes i was away i was i was in greece strangely yeah. enough mm -hmm. uh, but not on holiday i was at a conference and i started writing down my idea it was just it was going to be quite a short short story. But when I got back home, I had other things to do, but the idea was still there and it was sort of going around. And I suddenly, I thought of it again the other day and I thought, it's a pandemic story because it was, the scenes were empty cities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I won't say any more about the story because maybe I will write it, but I kind of felt like, oh, I can't do it now <laughs> because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But um, at some point, I probably will write it, and there it will be seen in terms of the pandemic. Whereas yeah. if I wrote it a year ago, uh, and it was coming out now, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I would have been seen as very, uh, I don't know, Impressive. Impressive. psychic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, look at look at. Have you read Survivor Song, the Paul Tremblay's novel? Yes, just finished that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, by God, that's damn prescient to a disturbing extent. But you know. <laughs> yeah. Presumably. What was the title? A survivor Song. Oh, no, I haven't. Uh, highly recommended. July 7th, I think, it's released in the UK. Uh, but, well, good Lord, I read it months ago, beginning of the year. You must have got an arc like I did. I you? did, yes, I did. Yes, so I can vouch for the fact that, you know, he wasn't writing it because of the pandemic. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so how often do you look back at your work? And have you ever been tempted to rewrite a story for, you know, republication if, if how you wrote it when you, when you initially wrote it didn't quite fit the sort of social political landscape of the world at the moment? Hmm. Well, I normally, if I'm rereading it, it's because it's going to be reprinted hmm. um, sometimes or, or I'm reading the proofs of something. And it's true, I have, I have had to struggle sometimes against the desire to make a few small changes, but they would just be, it's more like a kind of tidying up rather than, and occasionally there is something where I feel like, I, I mean, I was recently reading a, a French uh, novel, well, in English, and in the translation, it's a, a book by Fred Vargas. <clears throat> and there was a little note at the beginning saying, this is set in the 90s. Because, of course, it's only, you know, it only got translated a few years ago. And I thought, it's almost like you, well, you do have to say that now. Because in, in cases like a, a detective novel or something, or people are in danger, you're thinking, well, why don't they just get out their phones? Or why aren't they online? Why aren't they looking things up in this, you know? Yeah. And it's so easy to forget that these are modern stories, but they're, but, you know, you have to kind of, they've become historical mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And I just feel that, Yes, with short stories, it's rather difficult, <laughs> but I just would hope people would realize, look at the publication date, realize this is a 20 or 30 or 40 year old story. And you just, it, it seems, I could never do the Henry James thing of going back and totally rewriting um, even a short story, but certainly never a book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you really, uh, with all of that. But I mean, <laughs> I, I'd go further actually, when I, I, often enough, when I'm rereading an old story again, you know, because it's being reprinted, so I've got to proofread it. Um, and I, 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 I'm too often tempted to, to redo it so because I, I like the, the rest of it. If, if there are any good bits, I like the rest of it to be better, you know? 
And there, there are stories about the constantly. I mean, the, there's another story called The Companion, for instance, which I know, you know, some folk do like that story, but I just look at the first half of that and think, oh, God, I wish I could take this apart and do it again. But I, I actually almost tried once, but it's too remote. You know, I can't. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not the person who wrote that story any longer. And if I started tinkering with it, you know, I, I think it would just, and yet, you know, people like Stravinsky were constantly going back to their old scores 20 years later and, and re revising them. And um, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the results are very interesting. But uh, again, you know, I, th I think me, if I started fiddling with old stuff, I'd never stop. And I'd, I'd rather try and, you know, do it better next time instead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I can see doing it if you if you had absolutely no more ideas. <laughs> Maybe, but as long as you're intending to write something new, get yeah. on and write the new thing rather than go back and tinker with the old one. Yeah. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. I think we've got about ten minutes left, so I'm going to jump quite far ahead. Um, you've both recently, in recent years, been picked up by relatively new publishers, uh, Flame Tree and Valencore. What do these new presses offer writers such as yourself who've you know been on the scene for many years? Oh, flame tree, by gum, enormous enthusiasm, I, I would say. I mean, uh, in fact, I mean, Don Doria is the is my editor there, yes. and you know, we have known him for, for quite a few years. We've worked together before, uh, and it's great to be back with him. You know, but but I have to say, um, we don't without in any way denigrating any other publishers of mine. I don't think I've been with any publisher previously who has been so enthusiastic in terms of publicity and promotion. And by gum, do they get it right? I mean, uh, well, you know, when they put you on the front cover of the bookseller, uh, you know they're serious about what they're doing. And equally, you know, as, some, as, as Steve Boku said this, actually, you know, it shows they're serious about our field. So, you know, more power to them. And I'm, I'm extremely happy to be with them. Mm -hmm. Well... I mean, all I can say, my experience, of course, with Valancourt has been reprints. Mm -hmm. And it's always wonderful to get old, out-of-print books back into print, especially in print, because although all my backlist is available in the UK as e-books, mm -hmm. they, it's Joe Fletcher Books, love my publisher, but, you know, they're not going to bring out every single one of my books in paperback again, let alone hardcover. And so Valancourt, they want to bring out, yes, they're doing ebooks, so it makes it available in America. And it gives me another, I mean, there was never an American edition of A Nest of Nightmares, although I think I signed three contracts. <laughs> well, no, maybe it was only two. And the uh, one was, you know, it went when the, with the big bust after Boom went to bust. And the other one, I think that the company just went under. Um, and as for smaller presses, I mean, I think they're the, the future. And new, and new companies. I mean, I love the idea instead of having, you know, kind of five great big international behemoths yeah. that if one editor there turns you down, probably the others aren't going to take it on either. Uh, yeah. So um, it's good to have enthusiasm. Yes, yes. It's wonderful if they really, really want to publish you. That's great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry there. <laughs> How would you both like your legacy to be remembered? You know, we're, we're talking about you know, sort of how you've managed to survive. Well, it must be almost ninety years between the pair of you. <laughs> the, uh, That's uh, terrifying. Uh, so you know, how how would you like your own personal legacy to be remembered for for future generations? Oh well, I I'd like to be seen as a kind of stage in the progress of the field. Really, you know, um, I mean, I, I I'm very conscious of being in a, in a kind of tradition you know, preceded by, well, I mean, folk like, I mean, there's bits of Poe, bits of Blackwood, bits of Mackin, bits of Lovecraft, bits of M.R. James, bits of Liber for sure, you know. Um, but, well, I'm, I'm kind of happy that, well, actually, I'm very happy that um, there are writers who, you know, seem to think that uh, they've learned stuff from me and, and, and get, you know, built on what I've, what I've done. So, you know, if, I, if I'm a, a small step in the, in the progression, that's good for me, and that's how I'd happily be remembered. Uh, it's, it's not something I've thought about a lot, but um, yes, I'd like to just think I'm still being read, that mm -hmm. some of my work is still read, and I get a little taste of that when meeting young, and it's almost always a young woman, who comes up and comments on some particular story that was really meaningful to her, or when I go, I've been to festivals in Spain and book signings in France, 
and I get these new new audiences there and it's and and it's wonderful to have a whole new generation to think all right yes I was young when I wrote a lot of these stories but the fact that they're not seen as incredibly outdated and of no interest you know so that's that is nice to see to hear from you know women in their 20s or that they that they that it moves them and they and it's meant something to them Okay, now before we move on to uh, some of the audience questions here, would you like to tell us about what you're working on next, if you can? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a new supernatural novel called Fellstones. Uh, and I, I have to say, that it's an absolute swine, it gave me problem after problem. And I mean, because I, I, I always like to know when I'm writing a novel, what the next one is going to be about, even in, in general terms. And um, I was writing The Wise Friend. I think I was rewriting it, in fact, you know, getting it ready um, for, for, to send to my agent. And I suddenly realised I didn't really know what this next novel, was, which would be felt, I was going to be. In fact, what was the point? I was trying to shape it in my mind, and it became absolutely obvious that it wasn't going to work, and I couldn't find the proper way of, of, of shaping it. Thank heaven, the one that I did write next, somebody's voice came and hijacked its, its position in the queue, if you like. And so that gave me a novel to write instead. But I, I finally did figure out how to do this one. Um, and it's so silly. I mean, it's just idiotic. I was so close to it. I couldn't see what was wrong. But luckily, I solved it. And that's what I'm writing just now. So it's a supernatural novel, Fellstones. But that won't be out for another couple of years. Well, I think I mentioned before what I'm writing is a third Jesperson and Lane novel about mummies, um, but it's, but I'm rewriting that now. I mean, I'm on the revisions phase and I'm about halfway through, so I hope I'll have that finished before the end of the summer. Maybe maybe by the end of this month. No, no, that's too soon probably. But I do have an idea. My next novel, I think, will be a folk horror novel. And where this came from was I kind of I live in the middle of a forest, a Scottish forest, and I wanted to write something that sort of set here and there were various odd little things little and so I, I started keeping this little notebook and just writing little things I'd noticed or thought about and I think Steve Jones wanted was doing a folk horror anthology and I got an invitation to write something I thought, well there's no way and then I got a little idea and then I thought no no that's not a short story that's going to be longer it'll be a novella or then I start thinking maybe a novel so when I I then began, once I was thinking about folk horror, I was starting to think everyone's doing it and people are writing about trees and they're writing about forests. And, and when I got Ramsey's new book, I thought, oh no, it's folk horror again. <laughs> but I think there's room enough. There's room enough for all of us <laughs> in the spooky forest. So uh, that's my next, the next book I plan to write, yeah. Uh, I have a question here from Georgina Bruce. Do you think reality is out horroring horror fiction and what can writers do to scare us out of our complacency when we can no longer be complacent about anything? Well, I think that's partly why we write what we write, actually, if, as long as we're talking about horror, you know, I think it reflects, it does reflect the state of the world. I mean, I've been writing about the, you know, the impermanency of existence and reality for many years. It just seems like uh, reality is caught up. And, you know, in a sense, I suppose you could argue that but the reality is as, as outdistanced it. I, I don't know. The other thing is you don't necessarily have to do that. You know, I mean, that not all horror fiction does does directly reflect reality. And the strange thing is that this this book of mine with you know, the wise friend that keeps coming up. Um, a remarkable number of people seem to have liked reading this during the pandemic. So you know, perhaps that's needed as well. That kind of sense of the uncanny and and you know. The, 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 the awesome. Well, maybe partly because it takes you away from whatever your current day-to-day -day worries are into something beyond, something yeah. much greater. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'd like. Okay, mm. I think we have time for a very quick one now. <clears throat> Do you, this is from Lauren McEnemy. Do you think ebooks and self-publishing opportunities have been a good or a bad thing for the genre? I think ebooks uh, are a very, pretty good one. I mean, I, I still favour, you know, actual physical books, but, but you know, ebooks are great to take away with you on holiday, you know, very compact and all. 
self-publishing, well, I do think you need a editor's eye. That's my my view, straightforwardly. Yeah, I, I completely agree. When when I um, look at the review requests that, that, that come in, you, you can clearly see which books haven't I even had the basic of editing sense and it. it's 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 saddening because th there could be a good story there but it's it's just drowned out in typos and bad grammar and and, and everything oh uh, was i supposed to answer I'm not sure. <laughs> i don't know yeah. i have to say about i think publishing self-publishing is it gives a lot of people an opportunity but mm -hmm. of course if they do it they have to do it in the right way which I think means bringing, getting some outside help, getting uh, the, even if it's uh, an editor you're hiring, you know, to give you feedback. Uh, I just think, and also it's different. I mean, different people approach it in a different way, but I think a lot of people have very unrealistic expectations when they decide just because it is easy enough to go and put something out there. Um, and as for eBooks, again, yes, I mean, I read both. And I think also it's not just for travel, but if you haven't got a lot of space mm. and, you know, you can get a lot more, you can still get all those ebooks to read. Mm. Right. Well, I think that is us at the end of our time. Um, I would just like to say a huge, huge thank you to, to both of you. Uh, this has been uh, a dream come true for me to actually finally be able to interview the pair of you. Um, thank you for a fantastic panel and, uh, Hope to see you next year, or at least yeah, the other yeah. conventions. It's been a, it's been a bit of a depressing year in terms of meeting up with people. But here's to next year. Thank you again, everybody. Hey, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.